All right, so Prosperity Records Recipes to Get Through 2020. Maureen G. Mulvaney, and here we go. Prosperity Recipes Week 8. And this is the basic recipe, give thanks and praise. And so, and we always say give thanks and praise before whatever you want shows up on the physical plane. And I always say, speak it out behind yourself and just say it out loud to yourself. Abundant blessings are showering me now. I shimmer with excitement. I am prosperous. One of the biggest things that we want to do in our course always is to retrain our brain. We know that our biggest financial guide is the Bible. And you think we would pay attention to that because it promises us great abundance and vibrant health. But we never pay attention to that. Instead, we pay attention to the news. So it's craziness. So this will help you. Abundant blessings are showering me now. I shiver with excitement. Say it with meaning. I am prosperous. When you claim that and say it, 100 times a day, that's 700 times a week, that's 10 weeks, that's 7,000 times that you're helping to redo your own internal um, um, uh, reticular um, sayings to yourself so that you absolutely reprogram yourself. So that's what we do. And our basic recipe for our course is know what you want, believe you can have it, Take action, give thanks and praise before it even shows up on the physical plane. And thank goodness I got this from the 21 millionaires that I interviewed for my book, The Women's Millionaire Club. And so let's do a little bit of review before we head right in. And we know, we know we're so thankful. I'm so grateful because when we come together, we manifest quicker. Every manifest so much quicker. And we always say, Every little cell in my body is happy. Every little cell in my body is well. Every little cell in my body is happy. Every little cell in my body is well. Feel so good. Okay. Feel so swell. Every little cell is happy and well. If you start your day singing that, I promise you it will put a smile on your face and the cells of your body will respond. They have to respond because they're listening all the time. And tonight... We say that all things are possible to him that believe it, him or her, of course. And I still love this. Money is not my supply. No person, place, or condition is my supply. My awareness, understanding, and knowledge of the all-providing activity of the divine mind within me is my supply. All-providing activity of divine mind within me is my supply. My consciousness of this truth is unlimited. Therefore, my supply is unlimited. We do not have a problem with supply. We have a problem usually with attracting that supply to us. We seem to be able to know how to, uh, to have supply all around us. We've got enough water. We've got enough food. We've got enough clothes. That's not our problem. Our problem is attracting what we want to us. So, this is always about prosperity. Prosperity is always, in my definition, of attracting it to you. Because prosperity is the outpicturing of substance in our affairs. Everything in the universe is for us. Nothing is against us. Life is ever giving of itself. We must realize, utilize, and extend the gift. Success and prosperity are spiritual attributes belonging to all people, but not necessarily used by all people, but they belong to all of us. Let me do this again. Prayer, energy follows attention, meaning what you focus on, okay? So if we open our hearts, when we feel that combines emotions merge with our thoughts, prayer acknowledges that, the, just prayer by itself acknowledges that there are many possibilities, but when we are praying, we're focusing our feelings, we direct our energy into the opportunity that we decide to experience of all the possibilities available. I love that. So that's how we're sending out our energy into the universe. Because remember, oh, Albert Einstein, everything is energy and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want. If there's one thing that makes sense to me, that makes very good sense to me. Match the frequency of the reality you want, and you cannot help but get that reality. That changed my life when I read that one sentence. 
It makes so much sense to me. It can be no other way. This isn't philosophy. It is physics. So everything is energy. Match the frequency of the reality you want, not what you've got or what we see around us. If we were to pay attention to the news 24-7, which I did for a while, and I had to stop it, because then you're beginning to match the reality of what's coming at you all the time. I don't want to do that. I want to match the frequency of the reality I want, not that reality. So when you vibrate at a higher frequency, when you vibrate at the frequency to match the frequency that you want, your thoughts, words, and actions, all things are possible. You couldn't tell me. Can you imagine me saying to you that I say um, 60, 40 is the new 60. So I am 49 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I said that at my age, at that 69, I've, I just said one day, I'm going to have 2020 vision again. I just, I, that's what I want to attract into my life. You would have thought I had lost my mind. But yet, by having cataracts, they took that out and put in a lens. I have 2020 vision now. This shocks me. This is miraculous. I, that's one of the things that I wanted. And I could not have even thought of that. But because I didn't know that that was a possibility that if you had cataracts, they could take that cataracts out and put in a new lens. I didn't even know that. So for this to have happened, talk about miraculous. So your job is never to know how. Your job is always just to ask for what you want and believe you have the ability to attract it. Prove me now herewith, says the Malachi. I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be enough to receive it. Uh, that Doesn't that make sense to you? I will open up the windows of heaven. The heavens opened up and gave me my 2020 vision back again. You can't make this stuff up, even if you tried to. And so for this, I mean, that's just miraculous to me, more than miraculous. And so when you tithe, you thrive. And I want to thank all of you that have made tithes this week because I, I, it is really wonderful to see it all come in. And so in this class, we talk about releasing with ho, ho, pono, pono. Because ho, o means to make, pono, right. And a double pono means to be make it right with you and the other person. Pono, 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 pono. And so we have to be aware of your beliefs. I say this a million times because once you can get down to your beliefs and know what those are, then you can release them. When you release something, it creates a vacuum. When you release something, it makes a space, which creates the vacuum. And then once the vacuum is there, then you get to fill it with whatever you want it to be. You see, most of you got your vacuum, you got your stuff, your bag filled when you were kids with stuff that didn't even belong to you. It belonged to other people in your life that you heard and you took on. And now it is releasing. So whether you're releasing physically from your house and you're letting go of old clothes, you're letting go of things that you no longer use, and you're going to send them out into the universe and bless them before they go so that they will be a blessing to someone else, especially our fat. Let's release that fat and turn it loose to someone else that needs it. <laughs> that is my favorite thing to release, or at least that big old fat. And so, and then fill it with vibrant health. Don't just release it because if you just release things, you're going to get back what you already have. So you must fill your own vacuum and put in what do you want. Then comes the way to attract prosperity. Attraction, in the law of attraction is once you know what you want, the universe says, oh my gosh, I've been waiting. Thank you. I can send <laughs> it to you. And you believe you can have it, then you can have it. You take action to receive what you've already asked for, and then you give thanks and praise before it even shows up on the physical plane. And once we get these two things down, release and retract, attract, it begins to work. And Michelle Bondra showed us that she was releasing piles and piles of stuff. And that's great because that means she's creating the vacuum. She's making space. That's not her house. That's not even her. I put her picture on that. <laughs> And then, but you have to then attract. So the piles that you might want to attract are those gold bullions. 
So fill your vacuum by attracting what you want. So releasing and attracting, that makes a lot of sense to me because money is just energy and money vibrates the meaning you set to it. You said it. Negative meaning pushes money away. When I considered money as the root of all evil and I thought money was evil, oh my gosh, it never came to me. And if it came to me, it left me as quick as it came. But once I release that, then I can attract and put a positive uh, meaning on money. Money allows you to do what you need to do. Money allows you to help other people. Money allows you to um, help the universe. And so when you have money, it vibrates. It's green. It's malleable. Uh, it's soft. It's wonderful. And you can do great things with it. And so money vibrates the meaning you set to it. I set a very positive meaning to money because it allows you to bring into your life more abundance for other people and for yourself. And so... You have to be aware, what are you drinking in daily? If you're listening to the news daily, you're drinking in a tremendous amount of negativity. And so are you spitting your out words, thoughts, and actions that make you feel good? Or are you regurgitating words and actions that don't make you feel so good? You have to take stock of that and pay attention. And so know what you want was this first step in our recipe to success. Know what you want. And it's just like the waitress says, sugar, what do you want? If you say, well, I don't know what I want, she'll thump you on the head and say, I'll come back when you are ready. That's what the universe always says to you, know what you want. If you don't know what you want, the universe will thump you on the head and say, I'll come back when you're ready. Then you don't get what you want because you weren't ready. You've got to clear it up. Be clear. Decide what you want. And a lot of us, like me, could not decide early on, know what you want. I didn't have a clue, but I knew what I didn't want. And then one week, last week or the week before, I talked about, I hate it. You have to empty your bags out. What, it, what have you got left over that you need to release? So I hated living in an apartment. I hated living in an apartment. By knowing what you don't want, it tells you what you do want. So what did that mean? I must have wanted a house. So I could buy a house, I could rent a house, I could um, have all kinds of things. But for me, once I decided what I didn't want, then it could tell me what I did want. Now, the same thing with working. I once said, you know, said, I don't know what I want. But I looked at what I didn't want. I didn't like, I love being a teacher, but I didn't like uh, having somebody um, monitor me all the time like I was a child. I didn't like nine to five. I didn't like somebody else telling me what the rules were. And so that meant when I looked at all the things I didn't want, I didn't like nine to five. I didn't want to be ruled by someone else's rules. I wanted to make my own. It made me understand what I did want was to be an entrepreneur. No one in my family had ever been an entrepreneur. So this was hugely different. And this was kind of out, way out of my comfort zone because I had nobody. My mother, father, sister, brother uh, all worked for the federal government. So they liked um, uh, comfort and security. And I tried working for the federal government for one year and thought I would lose my mind. So I knew that was not what was good for me. So what you don't want can help you determine what you do want. It can convert what you don't want into what you do want. So clarity is the key to manifesting. The clearer you get about what you want, what kind of car you want, what kind of house you want, what kind of job you want, what kind of spouse you want, what kind of love partner, what kind of business partner, it becomes much clearer and you're easier to manifest. And so, um, when we get clear about the kind of person you might want to bring into your practice, then it is, I want a person that's honest. I want a person that's got integrity. I want a hardworking person. I, you, know, you define it, then you have a better chance of attracting that kind of person into your practice. All right. Your job is always to know what you want. That's your job. And so God's job is to know how and send you the resources. Your God's job is to know how and send you the resources. In a million years, I would never have thought the resources for me was to get a cataract surgery, which would give me 20-20 vision. In a million years, I would never have thought that up. And so yet, 
my job was to know what I want. And because my brother and sister have one, my brother's older, my sister's younger, and they have 20, 20 vision. I and my mother and father had 20, 20 vision late in life. I just wanted 20, 20 vision. And I've worn glasses for years now. And I love glasses, to be honest with you. I kind of like them. But I manufactured that because even as a kid, I used to say, I love glasses. I don't want to wear glasses. So my job was to know what I want. And I wanted 2020 vision. God came up with a solution, gave me cataracts, which then gave me the ability to get new lenses. <laughs> Who would have thought that up in a million years? So you don't have to tell you, you don't have to know how you're going to do something. You just have to know what you want. Then the next step in the recipe is believe you can have it. That means beliefs are formed. Experiences form your thoughts. Bundled thoughts form your beliefs. Your beliefs form your picture of reality, whether it's true or not, it makes no difference. And then you gather evidence to support your beliefs. That's why right now in the United States of America, we are so divided because People have got formed beliefs and that's their picture of reality and they're gathering evidence to support their beliefs. Some people will only watch Fox. Some people will only watch CNN. And it's interesting. It's like two separate realities. When you watch one channel, you would believe there is no COVID. You would believe that, that you know everything is perfect. It's shocking. I mean, it's, it's really shocking. So this is, we've got, we can ample, ample evidence of what's happening in the world is to show us what beliefs do, how they're formed and how strong they are. Now, here's another way to look at your beliefs because what you cannot see is your belief system. They were formed usually early on in your life from uh, age three, you know, you started believing things. Your money, your beliefs about money are already formed. By the time you're age seven, you already have almost all of your beliefs formed about money by age seven. And so your belief systems are formed very early on. So they're not even yours. They come from other people. And so those thoughts that come in from your five senses, then you go out from the thoughts, then you've got feelings. And then those feelings and, and those thoughts, that belief systems create the actions which create the results that you have. Now, here's the challenge. Beliefs that are positive usually will grow sweet fruit that is edible that you can use. Results of beliefs that are negative that you just hold on to that actually have no reality. You know, I believed in the Easter Bunny and for many years just really believed that and yet the reality was there isn't an Easter bunny. Oh my gosh, that's still painful to hear. But your actions go with what your belief system is. So that's why I'm constantly asking you to check out your belief system. And even with Holofono, if you do not know what your belief system are, then releasing some of the stuff that has held you back in your life, that created judgment, that created criticism, anger, and so resentment. Resentment is a challenging one. So mine was always about money is evil. And where did it come from? It came in through my five senses. The more senses you use when you're uh, developing a belief, if you use all five senses, it is cemented in. If you only use four of them, it's not as cemented. The more uh, senses you use when you learn something, the stronger it is. Then the filters are, you know, your um, nationality, your cultural background, the authority figures you looked up to. Were they your parents? Were they your preachers, teachers? Who did you look up to? Were they your friends? So filters are all the things. That's why two people in the same family don't even have the same beliefs about the same things because you filter them differently, even though you had the same parents. And then your automatic decider decides to keep some things, delete other things, distort and generalize. When I thought money is the root of the all evil, I generalized that to all people that had a lot of money. And so then the emotional state in which you learned it strengthens and cements your belief. And then your, your actions are to gather evidence to support all of your beliefs, 
So we watch news stories that focus on rich and greedy people. That's what I did. But people now will watch news, whether they watch Fox or they CNN or one of the others, they want to support their beliefs. So that's what the, that's the shows that they will watch so that they become cemented in. Beliefs are learned and yet none of us, none of us got a, a, all positive, negative, or neutral. We got a mixture of them. So when you look at some of them, you can neutral some of your beliefs out, just neutral them out. And so that's what we need to do. And patterns develop unconsciously. We develop these patterns. My patterns were developed about money. I didn't intentionally say I want to be broke in my life, early life. But that's exactly what happened. And it was only when I started thinking about prosperity, how do I attract? Then I had to release my belief about money as evil and decide that it was fill it with the fact that I could help so many poor people and help myself by bringing in money. Then all of a sudden money became easy for me to manifest. So you, you have to look at the patterns that you've developed unconsciously. And it, whether it be about health, whether it be about relationship, most of us have one thing we're really good at. We can make money, but our relationships fall apart or we, our health falls apart. Look at what you do exceptionally well, and then you can decide if you could do it in that area, you can do it in all of your areas. It just that you never did it before. So you got to look at every single one of your areas of life and know that you have the ability to change those. Thoughts, words, and actions demonstrate your beliefs. And so beliefs are what you hold as certain truths, whether they are or not. And so you've got to let go of some of them. We know that a single strength is prosperous thinking. You can double your strength by prosperous speaking. You can triple your strength and make it a uh, triple strength when you do speaking, thinking, speaking, and actions. When you get those all in alignment, oh my gosh, you decide your prosperity. Then it comes to you quicker, faster, and you can absolutely manifest very, very quickly. You decide. No one else gets to decide. When you were a kid, somebody else decided for you. But now that you're an adult, you get to decide. You get to decide what's the most important for you. And so number three was to take action. We talked about this last week. Take action means that everything you learn, you have to use and put into action. Forgive. Some people hate that word because they have held on to grudges for their entire lives. Forgive just means to release and let go. If you're holding on to something from another era, from someone that did something to you 20 years ago, then it's time to let it go. It doesn't mean that you don't learn from that what happened. It just means that you get to release it and let it go. Take inventory of toxic beliefs. Create the vacuum, which just creates, clears out a space so that you can fill that vacuum, fill that space with what you want. Not what you've had in the past, but what you want. And so we didn't go over this last week, but I wanted to. Um, which of these cakes do you like? The black one or the purple one? Everybody's got an opinion. Well, if it's looking at it's the uh, looking at the big picture. You see, there was a if you've ever watched any of those cake shows, there was a cake show that I was watching. It was so interesting because um, one of them, this gal was getting married, and she didn't really have a concept of what she wanted for her wedding cake. So she went into the first store and she said. I would like uh, you to make my wedding cake. How much will it cost and what will it look like? And he looked at her and kind of got a little aggravated. And he said, lady, you know, you have to tell me what you want, uh, you know, and then I can make it up. You know, what are your colors? What are you going to do? This and that. You tell me what you want and I'll think about it. I can make it up. And so and she was really put out because like most people, she didn't know what she wanted. She just absolutely didn't. And so, and she was really depressed when she went out, but then she decided to go to this second one. And the second store she went into, the second bakery, they said, well, oh my gosh, let come in. Sure, come on in. We'll show you exactly what we've got. I've got a whole room set up just for brides because oftentimes it's kind of hard to figure out what you want. So he took her into the room and he said, look at this gorgeous cake. Now, depending on your color theme, we can make this in this color and that color. Then he said, oh my gosh, let me let you taste. 
and he tasted a lemon one. He tasted a chocolate. He tasted a, a vanilla. He let her taste all of these different ones. Then he kind of gave her some ideas about what could go on the cake and this and that. And who, which of these bakeries do you think she went to to buy her wedding cake? The second one, of course. Why? Because vision is the big picture. He showed her a model of what she could have. So when you are setting your goals, when you want something, it is very, very important that you get a big picture, a model of what you want. For me, I never was big on cars, but my brother had a T-Bird. The T-Bird, actually the T-Bird out of um, that movie, Thelma and Louise. He has a light powder blue T-Bird. And he let me drive it one time when I was over visiting and he lives in, uh, we went to Myrtle Beach in, in uh, Cal the Carolinas. And I loved this car. It was a convertible. It was great. So years after I drove that car, I called my brother up and he said, if you're ever going to sell that car, I want it. And he laughed and he said, well, I'm not going to sell it, but I just found this one that I think it looks just like you. And it was red and black, a two-tone convertible. And I thought to myself, I already have a car, but I love this thing. I bought it and I had it shipped across the nation. I love this car because I had a model. I could look at it and I could see what it was going to look like when it was finished. The baker, the first baker, he did not give her a vision, a picture, a model of what her cake might look like. He didn't give her anything, and therefore she couldn't visualize it. But the second guy gave her a great visualization. You know, he showed her things like the black cake or the purple cake, and then she could have an idea of what might be exciting to her. So everybody, when you're working on your goals, Creating a vision, a big picture, a model, whether it be a 3D model, whether it be, that's why when you're buying a house, they usually set up three or four model houses so that you can go in and get a concept of what it is you think you want. How many bedrooms, what it's going to look like, what's the lawn going to look like, and this is how you do it. So this is the big picture. Then the recipe is the how-to the small actions to create the big picture. If I told you that you had to create one of these cakes, you might lose your mind and get overwhelmed with it. But if I gave you a recipe that started with bring together flour, sugar, water, you could do those small actions. Mix it in a bowl. You could do those small actions. Make it into a batter. You could do those small actions to help you create the big picture. You then bake it. You have to have the faith to put that in the oven and see it in liquid form that it's going to turn into solid form. And so by breaking things down into small bite-sized actions, you can take, you are much more apt to take those actions. We know that Deb wanted to write a book. That's overwhelming. So for eight years, she virtually did nothing. Why? Because the brain was overwhelmed and just shut down. I can't do that. But when she broke it down into small bite-sized actions that she could, one, call the publisher, two, Write a chapter a week, a month, a day, however you want to do it. You can do small bite-sized actions, but if you do everything at once, it's overwhelming. When I wanted to buy a house, instead of doing it overwhelmingly, first I took it into small bite-sized pieces. I would look at a house every other day. I would uh, take two actions to learn the HUD process. So small bite-sized action pieces will get you to the goal. But you have to have the vision of what the big picture, the model of what you want is going to look like. Then you can focus directed energy onto that. Deb is now focusing her directed energy onto creating this book. And she's already written a chapter. That's more than she did in eight years. Michelle's getting ready to move. And so what is she doing? She's putting things into boxes. 
She's releasing. She has three barbecues. She doesn't need three barbecues. She's wanting to give one away. So each week she's probably going to come, which will be a good thing, and, and tell us all the things she's going to give away. And either you can take them or maybe someone you know could. So this will help small action pieces that will help her to get to the big picture of making that move with directed energy. And so cook up the big picture. That's what you want. Fill your vacuum. If you create a vacuum, meaning a space you release, then you've got to take action to fill that vacuum by taking one small action at a time to get you to your model. What it is you want and what is it going to look like when it's completed? What does it look like? The unconscious mind has the power to control all or most of your important life decisions. You have to become conscious of what you want and decisions change your image of reality. When Mary saw my daughter, saw me smoking, and you know, you know, 20 years ago, it was so upsetting to me. Instantly, I changed my picture of reality and I never smoked another cigarette after that. So decision, I decided to quit smoking at that moment in time. And so we all have circumstances. These are things that come up in your life. Some are positive, some are negative. They're just circumstances. Now, when you're below the line, you become a victim. And this is an easy way for you to tell whether you're a victim or not. When you're a victim, we learn to blame others, make excuses, and deny anything we had any responsibility for that. We have a leader in the White House that denies responsibility for many things. And yet, it's so it's easy for us to see blaming excuses and denial in action and how that can be harmful when people in power do this to the extent that they can. So they become victims. When you're a victim, what then happens is you have reasons why you didn't get done what you should have gotten done. And then you relive your failures. We cry and whine about everything that went wrong in our lives. And because misery loves company, what we tend to do is we tend to like to attract to us people that are going to what? Follow our beliefs that are going to absolutely give us sympathy and empathy when we tell them all the things that went wrong in our life and why we should blame this one and that one and it wasn't my fault and it's all theirs. We relive these failures. What will we get? More failures. Because the universe is always listening whether you like it or not and the universe will send you more of the same. So victims a lot of times get victimized more. Have you ever seen this? It happens. The other side of the coin is to be a victor. And a victor is owner of your thoughts and beliefs, accountable for your actions, responsible for your results, owner of your thoughts and beliefs. You think this, no one else on the planet thinks the same way you do accountable for your actions. You're accountable for every action, every behavior that you take. And then you're responsible for your results. Ponopolopono shows us that when we are 100% responsible for all of the results in our lives, our lives change. Because when I'm responsible for my results, I get to decide what I want in my life and I get to attract that or not. And so when you're, uh, or you owner of your, uh, owner of your thoughts and beliefs, accountable for your actions and responsible for your results, then you get results in your life. And then you have the choice to relive your successes. Isn't it more effective for you to relive the successes in your life? But how often do we do that? How often do we tell people again and again and again, you did something so wonderful and look at my eyes, my look at these peepers, I've got new peepers and jeepers creepers, I've got new peepers so I can see. And so we relive our successes. So that is your choice. Everyone's always going to have circumstances. Things happen to you in life. 
you are either below the line and a victim or you're above the line and a victor. Sometimes we go back and forth. Once you learn this, a lot of times you will vacillate. But the thing now is, instead of being a victim for hours, days, weeks, and months, now you might be a victim for an hour and you pop back up and say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why would I want to relive these failures? This is ridiculous. I'm not doing it anymore. So then you make the choice and you decide to become the victor and own your own thoughts and beliefs. I'm accountable for my actions and I'm responsible for my results. And life gets great. When you're a victim, you get sour results and you're going to get more and more and more of the same. When you're an uh, or and you're owner of your own thoughts and beliefs, you take accountability for your actions and you are responsible for your results. results sweet beliefs. It's, it, it's sweet results happen. The easy way to remember this is get out of bed, blame, excuses, and deny. Grab your or, owner of your thoughts and beliefs, accountable for your actions, responsible for your results. Row yourself prosperous. And once you do that, oh my gosh, your life changes when you decide to do this. So when you've got a circumstance, all you have to do is step up and take action. Take action. I own my own thoughts. And I don't have to blame anybody for what just happened. I'm accountable and I'm responsible and I'm the victim. I'm the victor over my circumstance. And when you do that, you decide. When you decide, oh my gosh, the amount of confidence that you have, you might not like some of the stuff that happened in life, but you decide and you take action. The results you're experiencing are the results you created. Let me repeat that. The results you are experiencing are the results you created. If there's an area of your life, your health, your relationships, your job, um, your treasures, whatever is not where you want it to be, you have the ability to change that. You don't have to wait for your spouse, your children, or someone else to do it to change. Because when we blame somebody else, we got to wait for them to change. And then what are the chances that's going to happen? It's not, they're not good. So when you take full responsibility, oh my gosh, it makes a difference. So giving thanks and praise is step four. Before it arrives on the physical plane, you have to give thanks and praise before it arrives on the physical plane. And so it's story time. And I want to tell you the story of I am so grateful and I am so thankful to God that I had the mother that I had. She was a joy. She was just the greatest thing since sliced bread. My mother was the sweetest, kindest, most gentle person on the planet. And she was such a wonderful mother. And I, I just had such a joyful, uh, uh, such a lovely childhood. I, I remember just uh, I just having a wonderful childhood because I had such a sweet, sweet, sweet natured mother. And so interestingly enough, because I had such a sweet mother, of course, I wanted children my whole life. And so when I went after a lengthy, arduous adoption process, I, uh, I was older. I was 40 years old when I decided I really wanted to adopt. So I went to Vietnam and I was so grateful because that was the orphanage. It didn't look so great now that I see it. But at the time, you know, it was one of the big standing buildings in, in Vietnam. You should have seen the surrounding area. If you think this is bad, you should have seen the surrounding area. But it was uh, in the Ho Chi Minh City, which is now what we call Saigon. And the little one I was going to adopt, her name was Hoon Thai Thang Dong. And so I thought that was a little difficult to say, but there she is. And the children over there were malnourished. And so she had red highlights in her hair, which is interesting because usually Asians have very black hair. But children that are malnourished, of course, have red tints to their hair. So all the kids have a little bit of red in their hair. And, um, but Hoon was terrified of seeing, because they hadn't seen Americans in years and years. And I was a flaming redhead at the time. And so, um, so everybody thought I was Russian, to tell you the truth. But so the, the easiest way for me to get to know whom, because she was already a year and a half years old, was to go up and visit her up on the, on the second floor of that building. And so uh, I gave birth through my heart through this adoption period. 
And here was Hoon, and you can look at her mouth. She had a cleft palate, a severe cleft palate. So not a lip, but a cleft palate. So that the whole top of her roof of her mouth was gone. So if you put your tongue up on the top of your, root, uh, your mouth, that's your cleft palate. And hers was gone. So everything she ate came out her nose. And you can look on her little dress. It's all wet uh, down below her because she drooled yeah. constantly. And because she drooled all the time, it gave respiratory uh, challenges. And, um, you know, the other kids made fun of her all the time because they knew something was wrong with her. So she kind of held her head down a lot back then. And uh, so I went up and just sat on the floor with them. And I'll never forget it. We were sitting there and I was, uh, uh, her little, uh, the caretaker kept saying to mama, the mama. And so I was trying to get her to understand that I would be her mother. And if she didn't take me, one of the other kids would. So all of a sudden, all these kids start circling. And so she looks at me and she looks at those kids and she looks at me and she looks at those kids and she just went boop and she popped right over and sat in my lap instead of it with the caretaker. And from that moment on, she was mine. She wouldn't let the other kids come near me. And it was because she knew that if she didn't take me, one of the other kids would. So she was quite something. So, and this is how them, they would go outside. And I kept saying, I didn't think she could hear so well because, you know, all the other kids were looking at the teacher and the, uh, Marie was just kind of, you know, off in space sometimes. And so, because when you have a cleft palate, all of that fluid goes up in your ears. And I was right. She could hardly hear at all. And so, but anyway, so that's what they, and they would say, Mama. And this was her ears sitting there getting ready to eat. And they used to just feed them so fast because they only got like one little cup of milk. And that was a friend of mine named Hydrin who went with me to Vietnam to get Mayrie. And so and there was an instant connection to our family. And I named her Mayrie because my mother is my love of my life. I, her name is Mary, but everybody calls her Marie. So Mayrie was a made up name so that she'd have a connection to her grandmother. So, and, and then G was God is everywhere, G-I-E, God is everywhere. And so then Mulvaney. So once again, she would be a little MGM as well. So I was so grateful because when we were leaving, these were her caretakers. And, you know, she was sad to go because the orphanage was all that she knew. And yet when she came to my house, then all of a sudden, look at the difference in her hair. And just two months of eating uh, good food, her hair became very thick and very black. And it was very interesting how quickly that happened. And so this is Marie when she got older. And so, um, and I was so grateful that my mother, and this was Marie when she was only six years old, they were such close buddies. They were so close to each other. And here's the three of us. Uh, we, the, we were the three M's, Marie, Marie, and Marie. And so the three M's and, you know, just made a nice, lovely, lovely family. And so don't you know, this year, well, actually it was last year now, on the 16th of September, 2019, my beautiful Marie left the planet and uh, she was called home. She committed suicide on the 16th of September, 2019. And uh, it's, it's been challenging. It's been more than challenging. But I'm so grateful for the time we had together. And I'm so grateful that God sent this particular kid to me. And now I know that my Mary is up there among the angels. And she's with, you know, my mother. Matter of fact, uh, you know, they, they're both very happy to be together. And um, I've talked to them several times, uh, you know, and... Uh, they're just happy to be together. So this has been hard. And uh, I think pain is like a wave. You can let it crush you or you can learn to ride with it. And, um, you know, things happen all the time. We all have something. And um, for me, this has been so, so challenging. And, but I'm, I'm ever so thankful that I had the time with my daughter and that I did. And of course, her legacy 
was it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you that makes the difference. And so, you know, I could be down 24 seven and believe me, it would have been so easy to stay down. I stayed down for a little while, but then I had to come back out. And because the legacy that my Mary left me were the two grandchildren that I talk about all the time, Michaela and Matthew. And that's why I spend an awful lot of time now trying to get back to these children because the a son-in-law has made a decision that he's going to kind of keep them away from me. So rather than doing what I would normally do, which would be to communicate exceptionally with this guy to create the time that we would have together, he's made it challenging. So my prayer is, I don't know how this will happen, but I, because in the state of Arizona, it's very difficult for grandparents to have grandparent rights. They're minimal to say the very least. But I pray all the time and I ask all of my prosperity partners to pray that I have the time back with my children, the same time and that amount of time that I had when my baby was alive. Mondays and Tuesdays overnights and then every other weekend and then splitting the holidays. And then eventually I get these kids totally. I want them to come live with me and be here. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen. My job is to know what I want because what's happening to them now is challenging. He, he, uh, the the ex-son-in-law has made a decision that he absolutely hates me. And he said the most despicable things around these children, which he knows they're going to hear. And so he says them anyway. And so I want this to stop. And so the only way I know to stop this is to bring these kids back with me. And so I, my job is to know what I want. So you have to have faith to believe in something you cannot see. I don't know how that's going to happen, but I do know what, when you know what you want and you take action, that you have the faith that you have to believe in something you cannot see. I know that when you put batter in the, in the, in the oven, it comes out as a cake. And I can't see it doing that, but it does it. And I know that the sun is going to come up tomorrow. I don't know how that happens, but it does. So I have to be thankful to God that I've been sent all of these experiences and these opportunities. They're not fun to learn through sometimes, but it is part of what we all do. And we have the choice to be above the line and own our own thoughts, beliefs, and take accountability and be responsible for our results or we're down in the victim. And it would be so easy for me to be a victim because it was a perfect storm coming in from 19, 2019 to 2020. I lose my daughter, my grandchildren. I, I, I lost the ability to have time with them. And then all of a sudden I lost my job. So we all have something. And it's going to be what you're going to do with that something that makes the difference. And you could spend your whole life saying, why me, why me, why me? But the recipe to get through this is, first, you've got to change your language to neutral. Changing your language changes your emotion. When I blame him, when I blame the ex-son-in-law for all the things that he does, does and still does, then you can't change anything. As long as I blame and deny any responsibility, then I, I, can't, I can't make any motion or I can't move forward. So I had to change my language to be very neutral. And I had to change my emotions. Instead of strong emotions that I, I hate this guy or don't like this guy or resent, well, that will not do me any good. I can, I can hold on to that. It makes you feel good for the moment. And I could find a whole bunch of people that would help me and, and believe the same way I did. But that's not going to change anything. So I have to let go of your tragic story. I don't tell my story at all. You very, uh, the only reason I use it is here in these classes. And I don't tell it as a tragic story. I just tell it as a story so that you can all understand we all have something. And, but the more you tell a tragic story, the more you get... I, I've been through enough pain, to be honest with you. I really don't need or want anymore. And as long as I tell that tragic story, 
over and over again and how I tell it will depend on me. And so I have let go of that and use it now to move forward in my life because I'm thankful to God that I have those grandchildren. So you have to let go and be thankful to God for the things that happen. I know my mother and Mary are together in heaven. I know that as sure as I'm talking to you. And I know they're happy. So I can let go of that. And now I have to focus on what I'm going to do to get my grandchildren back. My job is to know what I want. I want for them the best, the highest good. And I don't want to hurt him in any way. But I need to have the right things happen and the resources sent to me so that I will be able to give them the best of everything. Because they need to have options. And they have no options right now. So I've got to be able to give them the options that they need to make the decisions they want. And the difference between power versus force. I love this book. It's a little challenging to read. This David Hawkins is from Arizona, to be honest with you. But force relies on authority. You see it in our policing in America. They say it is protect and serve, but they kind of let go of the serve and they just stay on the protect, which is the force. Not that I don't love our police force. I do. But we're seeing that there's been a breakdown in this, that force is the only way we can do. You know, I watch a television show um, since we've had the pandemic called Heartland. And I had not watched it. It's like 12 or 13 seasons, so I can watch it forever. It goes on forever. But it's from Canada, and it's about a farm, and it's about horses. I have seen out of nine seasons two times that they had a gun on that show and they never used it to harm anyone or any animal they used the gun to it was a rifle actually to shoot uh down something so that it would uh shut the container to keep these wild boars so they could re-release them in america if we were having a show about a farm there would be guns and rifles on everything almost every show in america has guns and rifles in it. I was doing a lecture somewhere and a lady from Britain came up to me and she said, MGM, do you own guns? And I said, no, why? what an odd question, why do you ask me? She said, well, for all the shows that you send over here to Britain, they all have guns in them. We, I thought everyone in America owned a gun. So force is what we seem to think is okay to use in America. And it's really not. Because what we really want to be using is power. Power is the ability to attract, magnetize, and draw in. When I have power, it's different from force. Force, I can make you do it because I have a gun or I have more uh, anger or more violence than you do. And I can make you do what I want you to do. Power is I get you to do what I want you to do because it's the right thing. When India was virtually a, a subject, a, a subjugated to England, England used force to keep the Indians in line. But when Mahatma Gandhi came along, he decided that he, that could no longer work. And he wanted to use power. And power was what Martin Luther King used, what John Lewis used, and that was the ability to love unconditionally with no violence and not to fight back. And so when the British soldiers came and they beat down the Indians and a call of them just kept calling up, calling, column of them kept coming forward in the ranks of four, the British would, would beat them down they would carry them off. The next four would come forward. This went on for hours. And the British finally figured out they could not continue to keep the uh, Indian colony with force because the power of Mahatma Gandhi, the power of nonviolence, was so much stronger than brute force that it stopped that um, domination. And so... This is what I like to use to vibrate high. And in the book, it shows you that out of all of the, if you can see here at the bottom of this, down in the red, 
The lowest vibration of human energy that we can do is shame. Yet a lot of teachers and parents like to shame children, thinking that that is a good way to control them using force. But shame is the lowest of the low. People that grow up that have a lot of shame, it's really challenging. And so if you come up with this, is next is guilt, apathy, grief, and fear. I know when I stay in my grief state, I'm vibrating in a very low energy, and it's very hard to attract what I need and want into my life. And so because I knew the difference between force and power, I knew I had to take back my power. If I were ever going to get through the grief process, I had to personally take back my power over my life and not blame others, not blame what happened, um, deny that what happened. And see, it doesn't mean that I didn't take responsibility for my part and what I needed to do here. It means that as long as I'm down in those low vibrations, I can't really move my life forward. But as you come up this chart, courage, neutrality, neutrality, not meaning that not being either for or against it, just staying neutral so that I can hear all the parts. Willingness, acceptance, reasons, love, joy, peace, and enlightenment. Love, joy, peace are up at the top. And so that is high vibrations. We know the people that we always know that have vibrated. She was up there, Mother Teresa was up near enlightenment in the thousands. Mahatma Gandhi, we know. John Lewis, we know. Um, Martin Luther King. These were all people that had decided that if you stayed down in the anger, in the fear, in the grief section, that you didn't have the energy, the frequency. We match the frequency of what we want in life. I want my children back. I want love back in my life. I want peace. I want joy. And I can't get to that if I stay down in the low vibrations of shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear, desire, anger, and pride. And so I had to make a decision to move my vibration up to the frequency that I wanted to match the frequency of my grandchildren because love is what I want to blanket them with and shower them with. And if I spend all of my energy angry and resentful on what the ex-son-in-law did to my daughter and the things that happened, then I will never be able to achieve and get to where I want. So we all have stuff that happens in our lives. It's not what the stuff is, it's what are we gonna do with it? Are you gonna vibrate low and stay there? Are you going to vibrate high and get to what you want? Vibrating at a higher level decides what you want. Once you make a decision, the universe conspires to make it happen. I can make it happen in my life if I decide to vibrate at a higher level. If I stay at a low level, then I'm not going to be able to achieve what I want to achieve to get to my vision, my goal, my model of what I want in my life and then set my action plan, my small steps to get there. And so I had to take small steps to come out of my grief process to get back to what I wanted, which was time with my grandchildren so that I could love on them and spend my time enveloping them in love and joy and laughter. And so we all have decisions to make and you have to decide what you want. You have to decide, decide, decide and gratitude, oh my gosh. Do you know how hard it is to be grateful when things in your life are falling apart? I know you do. But gratitude is the open door to abundance. Let me repeat that. Gratitude is the open door to abundance. When you become grateful for small pleasures, your outlook changes and opportunities seem to open up everywhere in your life. Let me repeat that. When you become grateful for small pleasures, I had to become grateful for the small pleasures that I was experiencing. 
your outlook changes and the opportunities seem to open up everywhere in your life. Gratitude is the only way to open up that door to abundance. So if you learn to appreciate more of what you already have, you'll find yourself having more to appreciate. If you learn to appreciate more of what you already have, you'll find yourself having more to appreciate. Nancy Reason was a friend of ours. Many of you knew her from uh, Unity of Divine Love when we were there, but she, she, was, uh, she had cancer. Nancy Reason came down with cancer. And she acknowledged the circumstance that she had the disease of cancer. And that began to ravage her body, which she called her earth suit. And in other words, she did not deny on the physical plane that she had illness. But while she, she, she would say she was there, her, air suit, her earth suit was damaged. But on the other hand, she did not place her attention on the illness. Let me repeat that. She was aware that she had cancer. And she didn't deny that she had cancer, but she didn't place her attention on the illness. Saying what you hear, so many people say, I've got cancer, I'm so sick, my hair is falling out, the chemo makes me throw up. Did I tell you I've got cancer? I mean, you know, we've got people that do that. And so a lot of our seniors, because the only thing they have, they don't have their work to talk about anymore, they don't have their kids to talk about anymore, they don't have the things they're doing to talk about anymore, so they talk about what they do have, which is illness. And so instead, Nancy didn't do that. She replaced, she placed her attention on wellness, saying, I might have cancer, but cancer does not have me. This didn't come to stay, it came to pass. And so she would say, my earth suit is being repaired. However, my energy suit is perfect. I used to love that about her. My earth suit is being repaired. However, my energy suit is perfect. So you have a choice on how you're going to look at all the circumstances that you have in your life. And when you are thankful to God, for everything that comes your way, you have the opportunity to make a difference in your life and others. Everybody, we know that ho-o means to make, ono, right. So double right, ho-o, ono, ono, means to make it double right. Okay. And so what I want you to do is just get relaxed, put your feet on the ground, put your hands open in your lap, Take a deep breath in, breathe in prosperity and let go of anything and be in the present right this very moment. And um, our intention, let's set the intention tonight to remove any resentment, blame, past pain or judgment so that you can now free yourself and others involved from any negative energy or projections that prevent you from moving forward in your life. Before we begin, set your intention to let go of anything around you and let go of all the things that you want to release tonight. Please focus on the core of your being that is underneath many layers of protection Know that the core of your being is surrounded by walls, fields, and body armor. And now gently close those eyes if you haven't already and take another deep cleansing breath. Exhale. Release any thoughts from the day you are here in this moment, your mind, body, and spirit. Take a deep, slow breath. Trust that moving forward, you are perfectly aligned with your highest good, your deepest well-being, and the energy of total relaxation. Sink deeper and deeper and deeper into this healing space of trust and surrender, connecting to the most authentic core essence of who you are on your highest 
soul level. Turn into the energy and the power and of the prayer. Uh oh, oh no, oh no. I am sorry. Place your hands on your heart. Feel a level of compassion for yourself deep within your body, warming you from the inside out. Please forgive me. Place your hands on your heart again and take notice of the response of your body. Allow this energy of forgiveness to move through you and all around you. I love you. Ask your body to open up and imagine the energy of unconditional love moving into your light field, energy field, and allow it to gently heal your entire physical body. Thank you. Imagine a soft wave of gratitude flowing through you and all around you, cleansing and cleaning you for any shame, guilt, blame, anger, for any of the past actions and words or choices you've made. Now, join me in connecting to the earth and grounding yourself. Use the power of your imagination to visualize a column of light moving from the base of your spine into the ground. Take a deep, slow breath in. Imagine this column of light going deeper and deeper and deeper. All the way until it reaches the loving heart of the Divine Mother Earth. Take a deep, slow breath, ready to heal and transform any energies that you are ready to release. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you. Now feel how you are upgrading your energy, raising your vibration, your frequency, and activating your light body. Imagine how light coming in from the sun is moving in like a healing wave, cleansing and clearing you of the deepest level. Take a slow, deep breath. Feel the total support of Mother Earth encouraging you to let go of anything that you no longer are in alignment with. Move to your highest good, your deepest well-being. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you. Imagine how this healing wave is helping you release any blockages into the earth for cleansing, clearing, healing, and transformation. Every breath you are taking in, bringing you a healing wave, setting your intention to flush out what is ready to be released in a healing setting. Release so that you can bring in more light and more life force into every cell of your body. Feel this wave of forgiveness washing over you. Realize you always did the best you could under any given circumstances with the resources you had available to you. Open your heart. Let you know, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you. Breathe in and start scanning your body. Is there any energy of judgment? Open your heart, scan it now. Is there any desire to hold on to need to control or manipulate your circumstances. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you. Tune into the Law of Attraction. Did you know that the Law of Attraction will bring you more of whatever you place your focus on, even if you don't want it? Please take a few minutes to tune into the idea that judgment is a powerful, powerful magnet that keeps attracting more of the same energy into your life over and over again.
Imagine that you can shift this unconscious law of attraction simply by dropping the energy of judgment. Open your heart. I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I thank you. Let a wave of forgiveness wash over you as you once again realize and acknowledge that you have always done the best you could under any given circumstance with the resources you had available to you. Open your heart to be compassionate to you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for the times I judged my physical appearance and told myself I am anything less than beautiful. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for the times I neglected to take good care of myself on a physical, emotional, spiritual, or financial level. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for all the times I believed others who said I was fat, ugly, undesirable, or simply not good enough. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for all the times I believed others who said are accepted and times I accepted someone else's standard of beauty, even to the detriment of my own confidence and self-love. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for unresolved shame, guilt, blame that I directed towards myself and others. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for the many times I didn't honor healthy boundaries and I allowed others to control or manipulate me or even abuse me. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for all the times I gave away my power, my time, my energy, or even my money in relationships that didn't honor me. I open my heart. I'm sorry. I love you for every time I felt unworthy to receive unconditional love. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for every time I held myself back from giving love because I felt the fear of rejection or fear of commitment. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for any goals I set for myself and then failed to meet my own expectations. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for every time I ignored my own intuition or the good advice of others, which then caused me pain and discomfort. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for every time I ignored those red flags that followed bad advice that led me to failure, pain, or just plain frustration. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for any time I missed any opportunity I doubted myself. I felt afraid to step out of my own comfort zone. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you. For any times I fell into addictive behavior to distract or numb myself. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for all the times I procrastinated, had negative thoughts, took unloving actions that slowed me down or held me back from reaching my highest intention and potential. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for all the times other people's negative thoughts, actions, and behaviors slowed me down and held me back. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. I thank you for all the times when I held on to a toxic person or toxic situation way too long. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you for any creative projects, business opportunities, financial possibilities, or potential relationships that failed for any kind of reason. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you 
I thank you for all the times I gave my power away consciously or unconsciously. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you, but I thank you for all the times when I felt all alone and unsupported. I now open my heart to forgiveness. I set my intention to clear and cleanse any negative energy on all levels of my being. I send it deep, deep, deep into the earth for cleansing, healing, and transformation. I imagine how the energy from the sun is coming in like a healing wave, cleansing and cleaning my soul memory. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I love you and I thank you. I imagine all of my unresolved emotions have surfaced and are ready to be seen and ready to be released. Breathe in and on the exhale, I send unresolved emotions deep into the earth for cleansing, clearing, healing, and transformation. I open my heart to really receive this message. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you. I focus all my attention on the column of light moving from the base of my spine to the loving heart of Mother Earth. I see Mother Earth cleansing, clearing, transforming and healing my soul energy. I see her sending that transformed energy and healing energy back to me, through my feet, into my body, restored, renewed, refreshed, vibrating at a frequency to match my highest good. I now notice that vibrant healing, high energy, energy move up into and throughout my body, connecting and mixing with the white light energy from the sun. I see that I am now a living conduit between Mother Earth and the energy of the sun. I imagine how this column of light is expanding beyond my physical body into my work field. I see this healing energy radiating out from me in powerful rays of light surrounding me. Beautiful, beautiful white light coming out of me in all places. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you. I imagine that prayer is assisting in cleansing, healing, clearing, and upgrading my light frequencies to the highest level that is in alignment with my deepest well-being. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you and I thank you. And I recognize that we are all part of one consciousness. And as such, everything is our reality. Everything and everybody that is in present in my experience is therefore affected by my actions and reactions. I set my intention to vibrate at the highest frequency. I set my intention to take 100% responsibility for my life. I am the captain of my soul and the master of my creation. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I love you. And I thank you. I'm now ready to re-enter my space. Gently wiggle your toes, wiggle your fingers, take a nice big yawn, take a nice big stretch. Oh. And when you are ready, gently return to your room feeling healed and transformed.